my name is Danny Wotton. I'm Time Team's resident community archaeologist and finds specialist. Now you might have heard that Time Team is coming back and this autumn we returned to the field for two new excavations. These brand new episodes are currently in post-production. In fact, actually, I've just returned from the lab to look at finds alongside um, Naomi Supol, our environmental archaeologist. And there will be more news to follow on this in the coming weeks. In the meantime, YouTube gives us a platform to share other stories and interviews from the wider world of archaeology, whilst our Time Team projects are in development. So please subscribe via the links below to keep up to date with all the latest Time Team news. Now, over the years, Time Team carried out many memorable digs in people's back gardens, including finding things from Roman mosaics all the way through to Tudor palaces. You may have heard about the amazing story of the young schoolboy Sid, who dug up a 500 million year old fossil in his garden during lockdown. It was a big story here in the UK. So we thought we'd base this interview on paleontology. In fact, way back in series three, Time Team actually went looking for mammoths in an Oxfordshire gravel pit with Professor Russell Coop. And we headed to the dinosaur belt of Montana in 2001 for a Time Team special to dig up a Tyrannosaurus rex. Now, archeology span and paleontology are two different subjects. Archaeology uses the discovery of material remains to look for clues to understand how people lived in the past. Paleontology uses fossils of plants and animals to discover what life was like millions of years ago before humans. But there are similarities. Um, both use physical evidence, as I've just said, to piece together and to examine how life, environments and landscapes have changed over time. And we also share that excitement of excavating things and making new discoveries. So we were intrigued when we heard about the news of Sid's fossil find. And actually even more intrigued when we heard the news over the summer about the discovery of a Jurassic Pompeii it was being billed as, um, a discovery in a, a site in Wiltshire in the UK, um, which it had been a momentary mudslide that occurred millions of years ago and instantly killed the creatures that were living on the seabed at that moment in time and preserved them for millions of years. Now, the unearthing of this discovery, obviously fossils get found quite often, but the amazing thing about this was um, that there were new species that hadn't been discovered before, brand new species. So that made this discovery internationally important for paleontology. So I recently caught up with Sid to find out all about his fossil find, um, and also with Dr. Tim Ewing, who's senior curator at the Natural History Museum in London, to find out all about this Jurassic Pompeii in Wiltshire, and more about the world of paleontology in general. And we even looked at when the two worlds of archaeology and paleontology collide. Enjoy. Hello, how are you doing? Uh, yeah, very well. Thanks. And looking forward to talking to you guys about paleontology. Hey, Sid, so tell us about this find that you've made. I was digging in my garden. Just wanted to have a bit of fun because of how much I like digging. Well, I did as well. And I still do. And I just wanted to have some fun and see how big my hole would get. Like last time, last time I got my up to my knees. This time I got up to where my shin ended which is kind of just about where my sh where my knee was. But I was just digging and I, and I happened to come across this thing. I found, I thought it was a rock or some weird shaped arrow or something like that. But then I, when we washed it, it looked as if it was something different, something like, um, like a horn or, or a claw or a tooth. Ooh. So what did you do next? We washed it and we guess and because we went to a place called Lyme Regis, which is a fossil beach, my daddy got this fossil group where he asked where he put a picture of 
the fossil on it and lots of people recommended that it was the horn coral and then we got the idea that it was a horn coral. Oh wow okay so what was it like when you found it then when you actually discovered it what, what went through your mind? Is it a fossil or is it a rock or is it something special? And so can you tell us about horn corals then what is a horn coral? A horn coral is a type of coral as it says in its name and <laughs> um, horn coral is just a coral really and and it lived about 480 million years ago and what? and it used to be like this in this way just stuck to the ground and they would just and these and these lines on it would just be floating up and it would just be and it, and then and then it just died off and then it would become a fossil and so is it a plant or is it an animal? It's an uh, animal? I don't know really, and I think it's a plant. I think Tim's, Tim's nodding here. <laughs> it, it's actually a type of animal and uh, it had little tentacles that sat on top of the, the, the horn uh, in life and uh, they would have caught uh, bits of suspended food particles that were drifting by at the bottom of the sea. Oh, so, yeah, what you're looking at is the sort of skeleton that it sat on. Uh, um, it's a it's a nice little find. So Sid, you said how old did you say it was then? Um, four hundred eighty million years. Wow, that's like such a long time ago, isn't it? I mean, is this before or after dinosaurs, or the same time? Um, be before dinosaurs. Wow. So we've gone back way, way, way back into time here. So where would this horn coral have lived then? I'm guessing in the sea. <laughs> It is in the sea. Yeah. Uh -huh. On the coral reefs and or maybe just hanging on to the cliffs that are in the ocean, maybe that drop off drop off sometimes. What what else have you found then? Have you found any other fossils? Yes, I have. I've got a couple of samples here as well. Oh, what have you got there? Oh, um just pieces of horn coral again. Um, there. And are these from your garden? Yep. Wow. This one my dad found, and this one I found a couple, um, a couple of weeks before I stopped digging. So what is it that made you dig the hole? Were you looking for fossils? No, I was just actually looking for pottery. Like my mum said, the first hole that I dug, which was where my dad then planted a, um, a, a tree there, my mum said we wouldn't find any fossils in the hole um, because mummy thought that they that it's England and in this part we she didn't know that this part was exactly underwater and that there would have been fossils and that she thought that I wouldn't exactly dig too deep but when the house was built I think when the mud would get would go would get higher up than when they were digging so the house could be made and I think they made them they moved the mud around a bit so so it was actually quite high up. So I did end up finding it about, I don't know, on the second or third day. Wow, so you were obviously quite patient, actually, if you were, you were digging for a while, by the sounds of it. I remember the last time I was digging for more than two months. Oh, wow. <laughs> You've obviously got the bug for it, haven't you? What is it that interests you about this? Well, I was first into it when... When I was start when when I was about four, I'd say when I started watching Andy Prehistoric Adventures, which is something on Netflix or YouTube or BBC iPlayer, I think one of those. I think it's BBC iPlayer. But but the and I used and I got into fossils then. But digging, I was actually quite interested in like like animals and like worms, slugs, and things like that, and also pottery. When I first found like glass and pottery. There's loads of different patterns on there. So do you have a favourite kind of fossil? Yes, and that's the T-Rex. A T-Rex. Oh. They're very big. <laughs> That'd be exciting if you found one of those in your garden, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> whole space of my garden. <laughs> yeah, they're quite big things, aren't they? <laughs> yeah. So what, what kind of um, advice would you give to young people that might be interested in finding out more about fossils? Usually, if you want to find a fossil, you, would, you might want to dig in your garden, but, 
But I'd suggest you go somewhere where you where people already have discovered fossils, where you are allowed to like explore some fossils because you're likely to find loads of fossils there more than in your garden. So I'm just going to um, speak to Tim for a bit. Tim. Hello. Hi. Um, this this find that um, Sid's made. So yeah, listening to Sid's a very uh, thorough and, and brilliant um, uh, uh, description of how he found his uh, coral. It, it sounds as though yeah, he's exactly right that when they were building the house, they might have um, sort of dug down into the sort of uh, into the bedrock, uh, and then that's, that's brought up some of these uh, uh, some of these blocks up to the, to the surface where they've then eroded down into the soil and, and the, 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 uh, the soft mud surrounding the, uh, the, the, the fossil has, has been eroded away and just leaving these fossils within the soil. Uh, so uh, yeah, I'm just lying there waiting for, for someone to dig down and discover them. It's a great story. So let's just try and put this in a in a time frame because um, uh, we were joking earlier. It's, it, I'm an archaeologist, you're a paleontologist, <laughs> and quite often people um, do confuse the two things actually. So I, I quite often get people say, "Oh, archaeology, I'd love to find a dinosaur," and ah, yeah. no, 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 that's not us. <laughs> that's you guys. <laughs> yeah, it's a uh, it's sort of a real distinction. Um, Although there is that sort of grey area, but uh, we really, as paleontologists, deal with things that are a lot over, a lot o older than uh, when humans started to have uh, a big influence on the environment around them. Um, you know, uh, but there's no hard and fast date, um, and there's no real sort of other criteria. It's not because something's hard, therefore it's a fossil, or because it's soft, uh, there, or it's sort of less greatly altered, therefore, uh, therefore it's uh, archaeology. Um, and we have a sort of real sort of grey area in our collections, particularly in like the sort of uh, Ice Age mammal collection. You say Ice Age mammal, like a mammoth, most people think fossil. Um, but if that mammoth has got cut marks uh, that are made by humans, mm. um, which are sort of defleshing the, 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 the bones, um, then that becomes a piece of archaeology yeah. and a fossil. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, there's this sort of, uh, you know, there's no sort of hard and fast thing. And, uh, you know, um, but, but when it comes down to it, uh, you know, uh, they both have their sort of distinct areas, um, but there is this little crossover. Actually, um, while we're talking about that crossover, actually, um, I know there's um, a really interesting hand axe in the Natural History Museum. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah. So this uh, a great thing we were we were discussing earlier about uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, sort of paleontological influences within archaeological context. All flints, all these natural flint tools that uh, that our ancestors made. Actual flint is actually uh, derived from the fossil remains of uh, of sea creatures uh, like sponges that um, not a million miles away from the uh, nice fossil that Sid's found. Um, um, and because of the, the sharp edges they get, but flint, because it was formed at the bottom of the sea, uh, also has fossilized sea creatures within it. Mm. And there's this wonderful hand axe that's actually got uh, a sea urchin fossil embedded in the head of this, this um, hand axe. And wow. so uh, the, the Neolithic human who uh, made them uh, was obviously uh, sort of had an artistic touch, you know, the, sort of people like to think it must have had some sort of, uh, sort of special meaning, but. Uh, or yeah. maybe it was just a pretty pretty uh, shape in the stone that, that caught their eye. I'm sure I'm sure it wouldn't have gone unnoticed. Can you imagine actually you're sort of napping that away and then you go, whoa, hang on a minute, there's a fossil in here. <laughs> Well, um, I think it's actually more more than that. Is that they saw it in there, they napped it purposely oh. to get it right in the center. So it was wow. it was something that was purposely done. Um, and so yeah, people recognised that there was sort of special. There, there was flint and there was sort of special flint. Mm. Um, yeah. yeah, that would have been yeah regarded, I'm, I'm sure, as being very special. Yeah, yeah. Wow, fantastic. So um, we, talk, we just talked a little bit about that sort of crossover, but let's go back in time now. Um, and like maybe you could set the scene for Sid's horn coral. Yeah, I mean, it was... Uh, it was, uh, it was uh, a long, long time ago. So, um, I mean, as I understood it, it was a uh, sort of Silurian uh, age. So from the Wenlock limestone about 430 million years ago. Um, and so the dinosaurs really only appeared about 200 million years ago or 210 million years ago uh, in the uh, late Triassic uh, uh, period. So this is a sort of almost 
you know, twice as long ago as the, as the first dinosaurs appeared. So things like Tyrannosaurus rex are actually more closer, closer to us than, than this horn coral is to dinosaurs uh, or the earliest dinosaurs. So uh, just to give you a sort of, uh, you know, an idea of, of the length of times um, we, we were talking about. Um, so uh, this was a time when life on land was really in its infancy and was only just starting to get going. And when I say that, I mean, we're talking like sort of fairly sort of, um, you know, uh, sort of, uh, uh, yeah, there weren't any trees, um, uh, there weren't any flowering plants or ferns or even there, only things that were really alive uh, on land were sort of moss-like uh, organisms uh, and, and, and some fairly substantial fungi, um, almost the size of trees. So it no. would have been a very sort of strange, um, uh, almost like journey to the center of the earth. <laughs> from, from, <laughs> uh, that wonderful film from the 1960s. Um, uh, so, uh, but yes, a, a very different world. And, uh, and in the sea, they were, yeah, we would have yeah, only had sort of primitive um, uh, fish and sharks swimming around. Uh, the, the oceans would have been dominated by uh, large um, mollusks. Uh, so things that were yeah, ancestors of the of today's Nautilus, but they were about you know, two to three meters long. Whoa. Um, you also would have had uh, giant sea scorpions on, and eurypterids, which uh, were, yeah, some of them are two, three uh, meters long as well, great big uh, claws and things like that. So uh, quite some interesting stuff, but the, the atmosphere was quite different today. Um, uh, and, and Britain at that time was probably sort of, uh, was south of the equator, so very different to, to position today. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it was probably in a fairly warm, uh, shallow environment. Uh, and there were lots of other things like trilobites and um, uh, crinoids uh, living in abundance in a sort of reef-like environment. Uh, um, so yeah, it would have been there would have been lots of life around you, but most of it would have been in the sea. So there were yeah, very few, if any, insects on land. Uh, yeah, so it would have been a very you know, different place um, uh, to, to what it's like today. Wow. So um, so how old is the, the, this horn coral then? You say it's Silurian, did you say? Yes, that's right. Uh, so, so geological time is divided into um, uh, lots of different segments of time. Uh, and the sort of, uh, and so we, we you tend to sort of swap between things and you hear all these names. Uh, they do all have definitions and there's a, there's a wonderful uh, international commission for stratigraphy if people want to look that up uh, and that will uh, give you a nice chart and, and shows you how geological times subdivided. It's just a convenient way for paleontologists to communicate about sort of general periods of time um, and they tend to be characterized by uh, a series or, or a suite of fossils um, and, and sometimes rock types, uh, particularly when those are associated with particular parts of the world. So, uh, you know, we might have heard of you know, the, the old red sandstone, which in, in Britain is always uh, uh, you know, associated with the D Devonian period. But um, the Devonian period uh, in France is dominated, and Belgium, say, is dominated by deep, deep marine uh, rocks and so uh, they have a very different concept of, of the Devonian period to, uh, to, to to some British paleontologists. Uh, so so we, um, yeah, yeah. Could you give us a uh, like a real quick kind of thumbnail <laughs> snapshot, <laughs> whiz through time, whiz through geological time? The you know first fossil life is uh, probably be looking at sort of chemical signatures in the rock, and that really is very old. You know talking about sort of 3.7 billion years ago. Wow. Uh, and then the next real big milestone for life was at about 1.3 billion years ago when uh, more complex cells uh, first appeared, the, the eukaryotic cells, which make up you and I. Um, and then uh, there was, uh, yeah, the next sort of really big event uh, was the Cambrian explosion. Yes, yeah, I love the four, sound of this. <laughs> four, three, three, five million years ago. I mean, it sounds really dramatic that there should be, you know, a sort of uh, big mushroom cloud somewhere, but really it refers to um, the sudden appearance of life with hard parts, um, so all skeletons. Uh, and this is where you sort of, you know, trilobites and our corals and uh, brachiopods and lots of other shellfish uh, really come into it and, uh, and uh, the echinoderms, which I'm a specialist on. Um, yeah, and then you have uh, the next big, big event was, uh, you know, life really sort of diversified 
Um, and then at the end of the Cambrian, there was an extinction event, and we had the Ordovician, which is characterized by a slightly different suite of organisms. So we've got the end of the Cambrian, and then we go into the... The Ordovician. Okay, yeah. And what, uh, what date is that? It's like one of my university exams. Oh, sorry. Uh, so the, <laughs> yeah, I mean, so that's, that's 500 we'll... to about 450 million years old. I, I can't remember the precise date. Uh, and then uh, at about 450 to about 400, uh, you have the Silurian, which yeah. is when our fossil appeared here. Okay. Uh, and then it's sort of about 50 million, uh, give or take about 50 million year um, increments through that. And then you you have the um, Devonian, then the Carboniferous, then the Permian. Uh, and all this time, Britain's moving from, from about 70 degrees south uh, during the Ordovician through to the equator during, um, during the Carboniferous, when all the coal uh, was laid down in, in parts of Britain. Mm -hmm. uh, and then Britain, and it was quite a tropical environment, and then Britain moved up uh, uh, north of the equator during the... Uh, uh, Permian, um, deserts everywhere, um, middle of a massive continent called Pangaea, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, it was all very, very different. And then at the end of the Permian, we had a, an event called the Permo-Triassic Mass Extinction, which is also referred to as the Great Dying, uh, when 95% of species became extinct and things like trilobites disappeared. Oh, wow. um, and uh, lots of um, uh, sort of mammal, mammal like reptiles, which were starting to really dominate the, the land by this time because plants had appeared during, during the end of the Silurian. Um, it was in great profusion at the end of the Silurian across, across the world. Uh, yeah, and then, um, uh, yeah, and then life sort of slowly recovered through the, the early Triassic. So another extinction event within the Triassic, and then mm -hmm. that gave rise to the dinosaurs about, uh, about 220, 200. 10 million, million years ago. And then uh, we're up into the Jurassic and dinosaurs proliferated, uh, Cretaceous, they continued to, to proliferate. And then we had the, the uh, uh, Cretaceous uh, uh, Cenozoic um, mass extinction or the KT, uh, which has uh, often been referred to in the past. And this is a, a meteorite impact in um, Chicxulub in uh, Mexico, in the Yucatan Peninsula, um, uh, caused a mass extinction event. Uh, poor old dinosaurs, apart from the birds, became extinct, and that uh, again reset the clock uh, for the um, uh, diversification of mammals uh, throughout the uh, Cenozoic. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, and then humans appeared a mere <laughs> sort of two to, to 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 four million years ago, or the lineage which led led up to us appeared about uh, four million years ago. Although it's one of those how long's a piece of string things. And then sort of modern humans, um, uh, yeah, not really my speciality. Maybe, <laughs> maybe you, you archaeologists uh, could, 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 could say about this. But yeah, I, I, I guess, uh, you know, uh, about four to 500,000 years ago, I think, is when, you know, you, know, you could sit down next to uh, uh, someone from that time on a bus and they would be identical to you. Mm -hmm. Uh, so um, yeah, and then uh, and then you've got archaeology and all, all the wonderful things that that that, that people have done. <laughs> it's amazing to think, isn't it, just how far back in time you can go, um, how much mm. life there was on Earth, thousands, millions of years, way before humans were in existence. It's kind of yeah. I mean, for me, what it, what it gives is is like a much greater appreciation for the world in which we live in. Yeah. Uh, you know, not just for the fossils themselves, but also the the culmination of life is what we're experiencing now, uh, and, and why the life that we see today, the, the interactions are so complex uh, and, 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 and so and often quite sophisticated. And that's because they've had the time to be able to adapt and radiate into all these different niches. And why, as a paleontologist, you know, I, I find you know, the current um, sort of loss of, uh, of, of modern ecosystems, the, the destruction of habitats, uh, the, 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 the change we're doing to our environment, global warming and, and things like that is so, uh, catastrophic uh, because you realize that this stuff takes a long time to appear and you know life will prevail but it won't it, you know the fossil record tells us that it might be drastically different to what we have done before um, and it might take a long time you know several million years not long in terms of the planet but when it comes to you and I trying to find food um, that is quite a sort of uh, drastic uh, and long <laughs> amount of time to survive 
Um, and so I, yeah, I, yeah, it, it really is a sort of call to me to, um, uh, you know, uh, to, to action uh, and take, take, take it seriously. How do you know? How, how do paleontologists know what fits into what period? How do you work that out? Um, well, we, um, we, we, there, there's several different techniques that we can use, but um, they, they essentially re revolve around um, dating uh, specific layers, often uh, layers that are formed by volcanoes or, 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 or igneous uh, vents, so maybe uh, not the sort of lava pouring out the top of a volcano, but you can look at uh, other sort of... Um, Sort of intrusions of magma, you know, within the rock, and uh, that really um, uh, you can look at the decay of radioactive isotopes within uh, that uh, those rocks, uh, and you can uh, and some of those radioactive elements just decay very slowly, and therefore you can look at them, and therefore they tell you the age of the rock, looking a lot going back. Exactly the same techniques as you frequently use in uh, in archaeology for things like carbon dating. Um, the, the, the techniques are exactly the same. And then you sort of, so you have uh, these sort of uh, igneous rocks and then everything between those igneous rocks, you know, therefore is no older than the, the lowest one and no younger than the, the top one. And so that gives you a relative dating for that package of rock. And then you can look across the world and you can correlate all these things. And that's how we know that dinosaurs existed between about 210, 250 million years ago to uh, 65 million years ago, because we're able to date the ro those rocks. And the reason why those times change subtly is because our measurement of those elements, uh, radioactive elements or decay elements, it improves all the time. Uh, and so we can refine those those uh, uh, those error bars. Um, or we actually just, you know, uh, you sometimes you're making a guess at that 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 that. that that, that uh, boundary because there's no sort of convenient uh, 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 layer with all those isotopes in them. Uh, and you might find a new outcrop where you can actually date it and that gives you a much more precise date. So there's, there's all these sort of different things that go on and, um, you know, and, and that's, that's, that's the nature of, of that element of the science. But it does give us a, a really sort of a surprise. I think people find it surprising how, how good we can get it. It's just looking for all those little, those little clues there's little pieces of evidence piecing it all together and it's a multidisciplinary approach people are bringing in new ideas new technology uh and so you know it's an exciting thing and it's still happening now you know it's not something that's you know dreadful phrase set in stone you know um uh, i mean it is set in stone but um not in that sort of sense of the word uh, uh and and you know and people sort of find that you know you know, uh, you know, sort of unsettling sometimes, but in other ways, I think it's great. It, you know, shows the sort of uh, that we don't know everything. That yeah. there are, you know, uh, uh, we we need people like uh, Sid to uh, you know uh, carry on studying and being inspired um, to to find out more and to do better than we've done in the future. Because uh, uh, you know, um, there's so much more out there to know. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. In fact, actually, um, I think that brings us nicely to. Um, your most recent discovery would you like to and, and in fact actually Sid was involved with this as well weren't yeah. you? Yeah so um uh, do, do you remember the uh coming down and visiting the quarry in Wiltshire Sid? Yeah. Did you have fun there was it good? Yeah a bit too hot. <laughs> it was a very hot day. What, what did you find? Just a couple of pieces of shells and I think that was it and a couple of sea stars. Yeah, no, you did well. Uh, you're finding those sea stars and those crinoids and things. So, um, yeah, we had a very, very exciting uh, uh, invitation uh, from a couple of uh, uh, paleontologists to, well, non-professional paleontologists based in um, based in Wiltshire, and they'd uh, made a fantastic discovery of a, of a new site uh, um, during the first COVID lockdown. And uh, it turned out to be one of the best fossil uh, Jurassic uh, localities in the world for um, uh, fossil sea urchins, starfish, and their relatives, and uh, things like uh, called crinoids, uh, which are sort of more commonly known as sea lilies or, or, or feather stars. They're, they're very rare because echinoderms are made up of lots of individual uh, plates, uh, a bit like our you know, human bodies are made up of bones. Uh, they're held together by soft tissue 
And so normally when these animals die, they just fall apart into a pile of bones and then they're just dispersed out. And it's very difficult to understand uh, what they look like from, from these dispersed things. And we rely on these exceptional areas of preservation uh, to really give us a, uh, an insight into what the, the, the world was really like. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, we, 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 we did some filming uh, with Blue Peter and uh, we got our Blue Peter badges. Which oh, was, no way. Uh, I, I was really excited. Anyway. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and, fantastic. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, Sid came along and helped us uh, uh, clean up some of, uh, some of the fossils and found some fossils himself. Uh, which we've actually added to the museum collections as well, because they're, they're, uh, a, there's a lot of very nice, and very important stuff from that site. Uh, I'm purposely not mentioning the name um, uh, to, to, to keep it safe. Uh, um, and, uh, but the fossils are quite robust. For a little example here, maybe I don't know if you can see that. And so this is the, the crown of a crinoid. So we've got the stem here the body where the mouth would have been at the top and then these arms would have been much longer and they would have uh, collected wow. uh, uh, food particles that were drifting past them. So how, how significant is, um, was, was this discovery then, this um, excavation that you did this summer? Uh, it ranks along the sort of some of the most important Jurassic uh, echinoderm sites in the world. Wow, um, it's, in the world? Uh, in the world, yeah. Um, so it's easily the best Jurassic locality in, in, in Britain. That's really for, for, the, for the sheer diversity of, of um, sea urchin, starfish and crinoids that we're finding at the site. I mean, we're even finding uh, examples of all five uh, representatives of the classes. Uh, so including uh, sea cucumbers, which are mostly soft tissue. So to get a fossil of that is remarkable. Wow. And also brittle stars as well. And there's loads of other uh, interesting uh, fossils. There's lots of fossil wood at the site. Uh, and then looking at the micropaleontology, we've got some really interesting things coming up as well as, you know, uh, more common shelly fossils and uh, oyster type things. Um, yeah, we got um, maybe three or four new species, which wow. is really exciting. Um, wow. And they're all beautifully preserved, sort of three dimensional, um, very little crushing going on. And they're wonderfully easy to dig. I, I imagine it's what, what it's like to be an archaeologist. That, uh, <laughs> The, 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 the rock that they're actually preserved in is, is, is quite a soft clay. Uh, and so it's quite easy to just sort of lift up these, um, these sort of slabs of harder limestone and the, the, these fossil echinoderms are uh, underneath and just turn them over, give them a gentle clean uh, and, and, and uh, they, they, they just pop out. We don't clean them too hard, we just do most of that uh, delicate preparation back at Back at, uh, back at the laboratory in the, in the Natural History Museum with a specialist preparator and, uh, and equipment. Uh, but nevertheless, that's, and that's what Sid was helping us with, was, was uh, looking for these fossils, turning stuff over. In terms of the collections um, in, in the Natural History Museum, do you want to talk a bit about that? Yeah, yeah. So um, there, this, some of them are super rare. Uh, so uh, there's uh, the feather stars that I mentioned before, essentially, uh, they, they, they just have these beautiful feather-like arms uh, and these little sort of spindly little legs and tiny little uh, body for a, a we should call a cup. And uh, in about 200 years of collecting at the Natural History Museum, we've got 25 of these cups uh, of, of, of these, um, uh, these feather stars. Um, not even the whole complete one from the Jurassic. <laughs> uh, uh, and in maybe sort of five, 10 days of collecting at the, 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 the quarry in Wiltshire, um, we'd amassed over 3,000 individuals. Wow. Um, so it just sort of gives a sort of insight into how good this site is when these things are, you know, for the last 200 years have been super rare. And then at this one site, they're super abundant. And that's really interesting because um, uh, these feather stars appear quite late in the fossil record. They only really uh, evolved in the lower Jurassic about 190 million years ago. And we're looking at rock that's about 170 six million years ago. Um, so it's sort of quite close to when these animals first appeared and started to diversify. And very early in their history, it's demonstrating that these were these organisms were able to dominate a, uh, a seafloor setting. And that's important because they do that today in, in similar um, uh, 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 sea marine settings where there's uh, a soft sub substrate, so like a muddy seafloor. Um, and it's really interesting to understand that that, that, that sort of behavior um, went all the way back to, to the middle Jurassic. Mm -hmm. um, and that's because 
these uh, these these mass uh, areas. They call we call them um, feather star meadows because they look almost like plants growing up, and they're very densely together. And they they sort of create a sort of biodiversity hotspot. So normally the the muddy sea floor is fairly barren. And then you get these massive concentrations, and they support lots of other animals because other animals are eating the um, yeah the waste products. They're reproductive um, uh, gametes and things like that. Uh, and so they sort of form like this sort of you know, integral chain uh, and ecosystem. So to know that this sort of this is something that we're able to extend our knowledge back, you know, maybe mm. 40, 50 million years back into the fossil record means that, you know, the, the, what we see today is a sort of as, as a wonder of biodiversity uh, and, and, uh, and you know, a sort of hotspot of um, individuals. You know, that actually has a very, very long fossil record. Wow, that's amazing. Sid, how, how was that? How does that feel to have been on that excavation and been involved in that discovery? Yeah, I'm just really excited to be there. <laughs> Great to have you along. <laughs> what, what did you have to do in terms of, were you, were you digging? How, what, how did you find these fossils? They, were, they already did the digging. We just had to search in the piles on, of rocks and, and slates just to find fossils on the rocks. Okay, so um, do you think you might want to study this in future or um, do you want to do something completely different? What do you think you might like to do in the future? I don't know, just find fossils maybe. <laughs> Brilliant stuff. Well, both of you, it's been really fascinating. We should also give a shout out to your parents, Sid, because um, I understand they're Time Team fans, so hello. <laughs> 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 Oh, here he is. Hey, Bish. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> you must be. You must be proud of Sid. Very much so. Yes. Um, he's been so excited ever since we went. Uh, he found that fossil, and we've been invited. Really lucky to have been invited to to, um, to so many places to learn more about fossils yeah. and uh, and meet some really great people like Dr. Ewan um, from the Natural History Museum. Chris, who's another paleontologist. Another paleontologist at, at the Jurassic Coast, wasn't it? Was it? Jurassic Coast or was it a different place? Jurassic Coast. Oh, yeah. yeah, from the Jurassic Coast to um, organisation. Well. Ammonite and a piece of copperite, and the ammonite was black, and I think I've still got it in my room. Oh, yeah. wow. Yeah, yeah. So we've been really lucky that we've been able to take Sid to these places because of what he found and expand his mind. And also, you know, especially in our neighbourhood as well, nobody really knew, or even we didn't know what sort of landscape we lived on. Mm -hmm. So it's been great to learn more about the landscape that we live on and the area that surrounds us as well. It's been a fascinating journey for all of us. Yeah. And Time Team, yes, a huge, huge fans growing up watching Time Team. <laughs> Yeah, we, can't, we couldn't believe it, it starts, we got, and we couldn't believe it. it was on for 20 years, it felt like a blink of an eye. Yeah, it's, it's a long run, but the, 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 the really cool thing is that it is coming back. We filmed um, two programmes recently, back in September, that are due out soon, so that's going to be really exciting. And we've got the Patreon channel as well, so people can subscribe and help support us to uh, bring back Time Team. And we've got um, the YouTube channel as well. So um, yeah, it's it's been an exciting journey for for us as archaeologists actually. So um, do watch this space because we've got some really interesting stuff coming up. <laughs> and just before we go, actually, maybe we could just get a little bit of information about what do people do if they find a fossil? What's the best thing to do? Where where can they take it? They can either take it to the museum or if they think it's a good fossil than they can, or if it's a big fossil than they can. But if it, maybe, or they can be like me, or, or go on, maybe go on the news, or if they don't want to go on the news, maybe go on Time Team or the news rack, or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so it's absolutely right, you know, um, uh, the, the, yeah, the fir first protocol would be uh, your local museum, uh, or, or um, the, the Natural History Museum runs you know, a fossil and rock identification service. Uh, so if you just look on our um, uh, our website for Identify Nature, uh, you can follow the links through to um, the, the, the sort of bright spot for the fossils. We also have uh, all sorts of other British biodiversity as well. Um, uh, you know, uh, and there, there are other sort of uh, collectors forums out there on Facebook uh, and in the, um, on, on the web as well. So uh, yeah, there's, there's plenty of uh, resources out there. 
uh, and if it's important, they you know, people were normally fairly generous with their with their knowledge, and they'll and they'll sort of tell you um, you know uh, the relevant places to go. So the great thing about paleontology is that amateurs and non-professionals can make just as telling contributions to the science of paleontology. So you know it's it's great that people can go out there but as long as they're looking safely and responsibly. So you know, if you're on private land, you need to get the permission of the landowner and things like that, and don't take risks. You know, climbing up sea cliffs mm. to ridiculous heights just no. to try and see if there's a fossil up there. The best fossils are normally on the beach. So Tim, I believe actually there's um, a recording scheme in the Jurassic Coast for people to record fossils. Yeah, that's that's correct. It, not every fossil needs to be recorded, um, but um, they, they've got a list of special um, uh, particular types of fossils that they want recorded. You can get access to that um, recording scheme through the, the website at the uh, Jurassic Coast uh, World Heritage Site. Fantastic, brilliant stuff. Well, it's been fantastic catching up with you all. Um, Sid and Vish, thank you so much for joining us. Um, Tim, thank you. Um, good Pleasure, luck. thank you. Good luck, um, all of you, actually, with your future endeavours and um, particularly with this fas fascinating excavation in Wiltshire. Um, look forward to finding out more about it in the future. And Sid, best of luck with fossil hunting. <laughs> Thank you for having us. You're very Cheers. welcome. Bye. We'll speak to you all soon. Bye. 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 To ensure you catch all the latest updates, please do subscribe to this channel, follow us on social media, sign up to our newsletter and join us on Patreon.